Welcome to No Hacks Show, a weekly podcast in which your host, that is me and Catherine, talk to smart guests about the many ways you can optimize your online presence. My guest today is Natalie Thomas. She is Director of CRO and UX at The Good. She leads a diverse team to discover untapped opportunities, marry visitor goals to business objectives, improve KPIs for brands big and small. Natalie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. So... The topic today is why industry benchmarks are bullshit. And uh, let's say a client asks you this, and they often do. What is a good conversion rate? What is your 30-second response to this question? Oh, if I could get it down to 30 seconds, I would need to keep writing articles about it. But um, I would simply say no two websites map perfectly onto each other. And that question does typically come usually not from our key stakeholder in an engagement, but usually toward the end from maybe the CEO who's just tapping into the project kind of closer to the end. I think everybody wants to know maybe what the ceiling is or what they should be aiming for, but no two uh, companies or websites are built the same and we could never map someone else's entire business strategy onto yours. So it wouldn't really make sense to compare two conversion rates to each other. That's a great answer. Uh, so uh, tell me about the good. Tell me about your role at the good and what it, what it is that makes the good the company that is beyond uh, we remove the bad experiences until only the good ones remain, which is just a perfect slogan for a CRO agency. Awesome. Yeah. So we do web optimization. We focus on e-commerce and subscription products. So that could be sort of typical e-commerce, you know, Millernal, Nike, brands you might know, but also subscriptions. So that could be anything from consumables to, you know, uh, monthly subscription products like Adobe Acrobat. And our secret sauce, I think, is just being really user focused and staying really user centered. I come from the discipline of user centered design and and I've been at the good six years now, so I feel like I've been a really big part of establishing the culture. Um, actually, my background in um, training is in industrial design. That's what my undergrad is in. And the foundations that you build there are really about understanding need, need finding is what they call it, building empathy for your users and telling a story that justifies why something should be the way it is, whether that's a physical or digital product. So we stay really user focused and in industry, that means combining or marrying user needs to business goals. So we have a really fun culture of just being able to say, I don't know, but let me find out. And that's kind of the CRO way. That's the way of optimization. Um, being able to say, I'm not yet an expert on that, but I want to be is something that we enable and empower all of our employees to do. And I think it really gives us that spirit of being able to dig in and find the details that will make something meaningful and create great experiences on the other side. That is a that is a, as good of a pitch for for an agency as I've heard uh, okay. on this podcast. So uh, one thing, there's this article you wrote. It is literally why industry benchmarks are bullshit. That is the, the topic of this episode. The the subject. Uh, you ask the question. Like you say a few times, the question should be why. Like why you're doing something, and, and, and like that is something that I believe a lot of people, a lot of website owners, business owners don't really think about. Usually the focus is on the how, like, how do we get to X? How do we get to do what this other person is doing? And I was lucky enough to speak to, to an SEO professional, Eli Schwartz last week. And the same thing for SEO, don't focus on the why, don't focus on the methodology, just focus, don't focus on the how, sorry, just focus on the why you need to do something. So why isn't again why why isn't everyone aware of this like why are people so obsessed with how to do x yeah that's a really good question i think data backed is just kind of a buzzword right now and everyone wants to be data backed but i think the difference between you know a typical business and an exceptional one is what they do with the data having data simply is not enough. It's what you do with it and how you understand it and how you act on it that makes it important. So yeah, thinking about the conversion rate, I mean, obviously it's in the name. I know you speak on conversion rate optimization is kind of a misnomer. Um, I've heard people say that it should have been called UXO from the beginning. Um, I think there is a really understandable crave to just understand what's the ceiling? What can I accomplish? Is there a limit to what we can do? What 
reasonable expectations can the CEO put on their employees to accomplish with the data in front of them. But the why is so much more interesting, I think, and so much more nuanced when you start being able to drill down into the different journeys user have, users have and how that translates to data. I mean, data is footprints in the sand. It can tell you where people are going, but it doesn't tell you why. So you need to keep asking questions and being able to follow that data and form hypotheses and form stories with it. That's what enables you to to turn things into site personalizations and make really tailored journeys, tailored to a user, just like you would tailor your customer service to someone's attitude if they walked into your restaurant or a coffee shop, right? So being able to make digital experiences that mirror and reflect the personalities, the needs, the wants of the people coming to the site, it doesn't happen unless you're asking for more details from the data. Right. And, and and you can ask for more details in many, many different ways. Yeah. I mean, you can literally ask your users and your audience. That's probably one of the best ways to actually totally learn about it and, and figure out what they're doing. So back to the industry benchmarks and, and why they're bullshit. I, I don't think we even need to dive really deep into explaining like why your conversion rate should not be like your neighbors, because it just doesn't make sense to talk about that or, or to, to think that way. But what about comparing your conversion rate to your own benchmarks from the past? Like, is that something that businesses should be doing? Yeah, I think it's not only okay, but it's advisable. Um, you know, we compare it to like running a race. You're, it's not like a team sport. You don't have to manage everybody around you. Just run your race, t track your mileage, understand your benchmarks from last time and keep improving. But I think that there's definitely something to be said for um, the idea that you, we don't know everything, right? And it's okay not to know everything there's we've mapped like over 55 different variables that go into a conversion rate some are off-site some are on-site some are completely within our control like how we describe our product and how well we deliver on the promises that we've made in terms of like fulfillment some are within our sphere of influence so um, like site speed for instance we can optimize as much as possible but we can't control for people that live in rural areas and then there's things that are totally outside of our sphere of influence so Things like, I don't know, weather. Did the weather prevent your product from actually getting there? Is your server down, right? So there's so many factors that play into a conversion rate or any metrics that are within and outside of our control. And when we think about comparing past to present, we can, you know, of course, compare week on week, year on year, but you still won't know everything. I think of this example from one of our clients who um, they just had a down week. They had a down week and they were asking us why. And we were all, you know, sort of crunching the numbers, looking back at recordings, looking at the data, trying to understand through all of our various metrics how it could have been. And finally, someone from our team thought to look at the Wayback Machine from one of their competitors. And it just happened that that client does a lot of Google Shopping um, ads and their competitors, the same that week that we were looking at, were running a promotion. So on that week, the people who were comparing and doing competitive shopping, comparing their shopping journeys that they were seeing on Google Shopping, happened to buy from their competitors. And so had that idea not struck, we wouldn't have figured that out. But I think at the end of the day, just knowing you still can't know everything, but we can take into account all this context and try to understand what's going on. You should compare yourself to the past, but ultimately, um, we still don't know everything. Oh, absolutely. And, and that is a great example, like a competitor running a promotion. It, it's not going to kill you because they cannot keep doing it forever. But not knowing what happened is probably not good in the long run. So speaking of competitors, is it is it a good to compare the change in your KPIs to the ones that your competitors are reporting, although you will never know for sure. Yeah, if, exactly. If You'll never know for sure. And so to start off, um, they could be lying, right? Just like you want to hold your data close and you might not want to tell the whole world how many sessions you get, how many transactions you make and what your conversion rate is. Um, your competitors could be lying. And so I think, you know, again, data driven being a little bit of a buzzword right now, being data driven shouldn't be the end all be all goal. It's not enough. We need to figure out what to do with that data. And I think rather than comparing yourself to your competitors and just pointing to them and finding the need to scramble based on the instant fear that some, you know, conversion rate number or metric number thrown out there gives you any discussion of conversion rates or metrics should be based around that question that you brought up at the beginning. Why? Why did this change? Why was it good or bad for me? 
So there are plenty of, you know, examples of where a low conversion rate or a falling conversion rate could be experienced as a positive outcome of a different campaign. So did you expand your billboard strategy? Are you doing a lot of organic social or even paid social? And how is that contributing to the ecosystem of your metrics? The inverse is also true where you know, you or a competitor brand could turn off a certain kind of engagement and immediately boost conversion rates or boost certain metrics. And that could just as well be a signal of something lagging in their ecosystem. Like maybe they're not very aggressive with their ads. Maybe they're not doing branded keywords targeting competitors, but you are. So if your numbers change, I think the best thing you can do is just do your research, understand the market, understand the competitive landscape, try to understand, you know, your, your, the economy as much as you can in the terms of how it affects you. Um, the changes to your website is another thing we can add to that list, but definitely don't just compare to competitors. No, absolutely not. But a lot of clients that, that you have are on Shopify, right? Yeah. And like most platform agencies. Shopify, like <laughs> most agencies, exactly. I mean, it, it, it's, if, if you have a lot of clients on the same platform, it's Shopify or WooCommerce. Otherwise you have some niche or enterprise clients. All those websites are kind of the same. Like the back end is the same. The apps are the same. Isn't it a natural response to just compare yourself and want to use whatever that other person is using or that other shop is using? Like, I guess it's very easy to fall into a trap when you have a platform and you have the platform defaults and you have the apps and the app defaults. It's very easy to also want to know if the result is the same that they're getting out of it. Yeah, right. of course. But again, no two businesses map onto each other. And I think about this example, we wrote about it in our book of we have three glasses clients, and they all serve three different audiences. So sure, the websites might be the same, the end results might be the same, even that you're all going for transactions, but your users are not the same. And as a result, both the metrics you're tracking and what you can expect to see in them should likely be different. Our glasses clients were, you know, readers that were sort of geared toward older adults who wanted not to compromise style for these glasses. Then there was a, a company who sold migraine glasses for folks who were getting them from light sensitivity. And then there was another company who was selling sort of like a sport glass. So something you could wear while playing basketball or playing tennis. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine just right off the bat how different those users are. are. Based on their age, they might go to different social channels to engage with their audience, or they might do no social at all. Is their audience on Facebook? Or are they on TikTok? Or are they on something new, right? Um, you can also imagine that they would or would not be doing Google shopping, that they would or would not not purchase on that first view based on the price point of the product. You can also imagine that if you're adding prescription got lenses, that all of a sudden we go to a new territory where turnaround time is longer, shipping time is longer, the risk is longer if they're not right and you don't have the right glasses. So yeah, we sure maybe all e-commerce websites do look alike when you compare them side by side, but when you compare the needs of users, it starts to get a lot more nuanced and I think a lot more interesting. No, absolutely. And, and and if you go back to the why, like why are we pushing this ad? Why do we have this landing page? It becomes a, a lot easier to navigate all of that. Now, instead of asking, like, are you at 5%, are you at 6%, whatever. And also, conversion rate is not an end-all metric. Like, sure. we, we should be very clear about that. It, it goes beyond, I think even John said this, John McDonald said this on, on the podcast, like, I can... I can make it 100% off and I can increase my conversion rate. It's going to go through the roof. Like, that's not what you should be doing. So instead of asking what your conversion rate is or what, what the benchmark is, what, what are the questions that the business owners should be asking. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Asking. And there are so many. Again, I would go back to that customer journey perspective. Um, I would say, you know, we, I would say get granular, basically. Looking at this sort of overarching conversion rate, that's never going to tell me what I need to know. That umbrella is too large, whether it's we're narrowing it down via industry or even being via just a few, like a select handful of direct competitors. To me, that umbrella stays way too big. And it's so not nuanced. Like when you look at patterns between how different channels might break down in terms of, let's say that one metric conversion rate, but you could apply that to average order value or bounce rate or time on site as well. 
it starts to get a lot more interesting and tell a story about what users are here to do, maybe what their patient's level is. Are they on desktop or mobile, right? And then we might tailor their needs to that. So I would say that's where, when you start to ask those questions, like what's my bounce rate for top landing pages? Or what is my average order value based on sort of like the campaign that folks came in on? Or even sort of where are they going next? What's their next page path, for, depending on where they're landing? You can start to look at all these metrics and start to form a picture of, okay, different metrics might be more important to different audiences. And then that helps you start to paint that picture of a user focus lens, that journey focus lens. And so when we carve out experiences for our clients, we often talk about them as if they're in completely different camps. There's the folks who st land on this page who are typically on this device type, and they typically have lower patients and they care about these three qualities of a product versus somebody who comes in on desktop on a different page. They're in a totally different mindset, a totally different need space, and their tolerance for a cross sell might be lower or higher depending on the reason. So um, lots of different questions there, but starting to drill down on those metrics on sort of like a per channel basis, per device, per landing page, it starts to help you understand your users more and then you can go from that journey focus lens. Right, and this is, in a way, this is just a more accurate way of what user personas used to be, like, or, or the way people use them. You, you're not talking about she's a stay-at-home mom, she wants this, you really are talking, this is a desktop user who came from social and, well, doesn't really work that way. Mobile, I guess, if it's... If, it could if, depend if, if on so the age, maybe, of I, the audience. <laughs> I, yeah, Facebook, yeah. yes. Or on LinkedIn, I, I forgot I guess. about Facebook, or, or, or LinkedIn, exactly. But that, then you, you kind of have an idea of, of what this user, like w where in the journey they are, and, and you can optimize. And also looking, again, at benchmarks and at conversion rate or any other metric, it's going to be completely different, right, for all these segments of users. Yeah, for sure. And so I would say on top of getting granular, like you can ask a lot of amazing questions like what's my conversion rate from Google Shopping? What's my, you know, metrics on a per channel basis? How are folks engaging? I would also say there's another step that maybe comes before that, which is understand the maturity of your organization and where you might want to be and where you might want to point your attention based on your goals as a company. So every exercise, every engagement that we start with a client starts with those bigger level goals. And sometimes we're stalled and kicking off and their gears grinding at the beginning because we either don't have the right people in the room or the team that we're supposed to be working with is not aligned on like what they're trying to do as an organization. I can't point you to what metrics to look at if I don't know where you want to take things. Are you trying to win, you know, voice of, uh, share a voice or you're trying to win market share? Are you a new player or are you maybe like, a, an in an industry where you're the market leader, you've plateaued and you're really just trying to monetize the users that you already have. Those are really going to change the metrics that we look at. So before we can get granular, we need to start at that level of like, what are our goals and what is our organizational maturity telling us we should be looking at? Then we can start to ask those important questions of the numbers and hopefully get the answers right. And then there's what you do with that information. So again, data is data. Data is the footprints in the sand. It tells us where people are going. It doesn't and tell us why. So with that data, what are we testing to improve? And when I say test, I think a lot of people go to A-B testing. A-B testing is great. It's an amazing tool in our toolkit, but it's not the end all be all. It's a way to understand how to improve the consumer journey and marry that to sort of our bottom line metrics at the same time. But as you mentioned, like customer insight panels, just talk to your users, right? Like how can you become known as an agency or an organization who is really tuned in and who responds to the needs and questions of their audience? How can we become just the people that everyone's obsessed with this brand because they just keep making their product better? Well, that is a lot more complicated that that process of becoming that than than testing a button color, I guess. But but that, that that's a completely different discussion. So yeah, uh, so you mentioned sometimes you have a problem where you don't even have the right people in the room. You just said you know because the expectations, I guess, they have are completely different to what this entire process of CRO and and, and experimentation optimization is. So how do you go how do you fix that problem about getting the right people in the room okay yeah um i think that we so to start out we have to have the right people in the room so we try to set expectations at the beginning and we've gotten better at saying like who should be on okay. the call right um 
And then we also have an artful array of questions that we answered that are designed as proxies. And actually, this is something that I learned in design school. Uh, we had a guest lecturer who asked everyone in the room to write down one person they idolized and three reasons why, or one person they admired, I think she is how she phrased it, and three reasons why. And I wrote someone who was an amazing architect, they were really engaged with their community, and they gave back to people who were coming up in their field. And that exercise was designed to get out of me something that I wanted to be. And she didn't tell Mm. us that until the very end. So I really don't ask clients like, who do you think your target audience is? And what do you think is wrong with your website? I try to ask proxies to those questions so that we can start to understand what the higher level, higher level goals we're trying to accomplish are with the site. And so that can be on a page by page basis, but it can also be as a company. So things like what are your, so first question might be, um, where do you see yourself going? Do you want to be like a story led? brand like an Airbnb or do you want to have a really wide product breadth like Amazon maybe you're trying to expand your product line and today you only have one or a handful of products but in the future you want to be the go-to brand for makeup like a Sephora that tells you a lot about where someone wants to take the site and it also helps me learn if there's buy-in among the organization for where they're going as a company and it's not really a test it's not designed for everyone to have the same answer but it's kind of designed for that to be a conversation where we get out of them some of the keywords and some of the goals and where that alignment might be and where they're headed. Right. And just going back to my first question, how often do you actually get the what is a good conversion rate in that kickoff meeting? Usually it's not in the kickoff. Usually when I hear it is when we have been working really closely with a stakeholder who might have facilitated that kickoff conversation. And then uh, if it's like a one time audit engagement, for instance, that question might come at the end when somebody who's been tapped out, they've assigned this to their employee, they check back in and they say, what's the good conversion rate? And at that point, I point it politely, um, link them to my article benchmarks are bullshit. A 17 minute read article. It's just brilliant. Uh, I will put it in the episode descriptions. Yeah, I I think that is a great answer to to anyone. I mean, you, you, it's just the wrong way. It's just the wrong path towards a higher conversion rate. It, it's not about beating a certain number. It's about beating your own number, of course, as you know. And uh, yeah, I, I think we should just finish where we started with that same question. So Natalie, I want to thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. It, it was a pleasure to have you on again. And uh, to everyone listening to this episode, please consider sharing, rating, reviewing, benchmarking, whatever this episode. And I'll talk to you next week.